this for all and get things out of here. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to our evening uh, Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin and I'm with Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. I'm also with Prairie Wind and Silver Sage. Um, this event is actually a joint event between um, Grasslands National Park, Prairie Wind and Silver Sage, and Prairie Conservation Action Plan. Um, every month, PCAP asks someone to do a presentation, either in the form of an online webinar presentation or an in-person talk at a particular location around the province. And it can be about anything from native prairie conservation to species at risk. Um, and this presentation will be uploaded, like all of our presentations, to our YouTube channel, so you can keep an eye open on our social media links um, for when that goes up. And you can pass that link to anyone who wasn't able to make it here this evening. Um, with that in mind, because it's being recorded, I'll just ask everyone to turn your um, cell phones down so we don't have any trouble during the recording. Um, just a couple reminders, we have a presentation in Avonlea, Saskatchewan, December 14th about the International Piping Plover Census that took place in 2016. Um, we also have a webinar on January 21st that is by the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment about species at risk modeling and a Growing Owl webinar um, February 16th by Corey Scobie of the University of Alberta and a presentation about um, the Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment Habitat <coughs> program on February 27th. Um, you're also welcome to check out the Prairie Conservation Action Plan website to join our newsletter so you can get um, monthly reminders about that information um, or our Facebook or Twitter accounts as well. Um, I would just like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by Grasslands National Park of Canada, Prairie Wind and Silver Sage, Friends of the Grasslands, and this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And now a bit about our presenters. So Stefano holds a bachelor's and master's degree in conservation and management of natural resources from the University of Parma in Italy, and a master's degree in wildlife ecopathology from the University of Milan in Italy. He has been working as a wildlife ecologist for protected areas and research institutes in Italy, Germany, and the US. He moved to Canada in 2010 and completed a PhD in ecology at the University of Calgary with a research on disease ecology in urban coyotes. A year ago, he started his current position as ecologist for Grasslands National Park, where he leads and coordinates science-based programs for monitoring, conservation, and management of the park's natural resources. Laura has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from the University of Manitoba and a Master's degree in Biology from the University of Regina, during which she conducted research on snakes in Grasslands National Park and was known as a snake girl. <laughs> She has been working for the park as resource management officer since 2013. Since 2016, she is responsible for coordinating greater sage grouse population and habitat monitoring. Nathan is originally from Saskatoon and he completed a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology at the U of S. He has been working in Grasslands National Park since 2014, first as a dusting technician, then as a resource management technician. Since 2016, he is working as a resource management officer in leads of vegetation management and grazing programs. Nils earned a Bachelor of Science degree in environmental science from the University of Alberta while working as a seasonal conservation officer in Kananaskis during the summers. More recently, he obtained a Master of Environment and Sustainability degree where he studied the system of wildlife co-management in none of it, specifically related to human polar bear conflicts. For the last two seasons, he has been working in Grasslands National Park as a fire crew member and resource management technician. So I'll turn it over. Great. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for hosting us and for giving us the opportunity to let you know a little bit about our program for the recovery of sage grouse in Grasslands National Park. Um, what could look like a very familiar landscape for many of the people sitting in this room is actually a place of very high significance under uh, global conservation standpoints. Uh, we're talking about the temperate grasslands. Um, temperate grasslands are considered the most endangered ecosystem in the world. Um, if we actually take a look at what uh, we really live at, so the Northern Great Plains, uh, we have to keep in mind that almost 30% of it currently retains its natural vegetation status. All the rest has been pretty much altered by human development, so urbanization, 
oil um, and gas development as well as agriculture. <coughs> Taking a look at a closer reality, uh, it's currently estimated that up to 80% of the native prairies in Saskatchewan has been lost. And in this sense, the Grasslands National Park represents the best example uh, of native prairies left in Canada. Uh, because of this uh, particular condition, Grasslands National Park is a place for species at risk. Uh, the park is currently home for up to 19 species that are federally listed, but we expect more to come in the near future because more are on the list for uh, listening on uh, the Species at Risk Act. Now, across the Peru provinces, no other species receives the attention that is currently given to the greater sage grouse. So why is that? Well, um, in 2000, this range of this species across North America was basically reduced by half of its historical range. However, if we actually look at what happened in Canada, we notice that this is an even more dramatic decline. Currently, the species uh, is present only in 7% of its historical range. And this is basically shared between small portions of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Now, population trends have reflected this dramatic decline for a resulting population decline of overall 98% in the last 50 years or so. Now, if we want to find only one good side of this sad story is that as the population was declining, the scientific community started to give basically increasing attention to the species, as we can see by the increased number of publication and scientific work that has been produced in the last 20 years, which means that today we are in a far better position to take uh, informed management decisions. Now, one of the core habitats uh, across the range of these species is represented by what is commonly referred to as lax. So these are basically breeding arena where the animal congregates uh, during spring, typically between March and May. Uh, lax share some unique features in terms of habitat. They are typically relatively open areas, but in close proximity to sagebrush cover. And also they are away from noise disturbance and vertical structures. This is basically to respond to two basic needs of the species during this time of year, which is safety from predators and uh, no interference. So on these lakes, males congregate and uh, produce a very unique and um, elaborate courtship. Uh, what you're seeing right now is basically the dance that gives the title to our presentation that we use as a symbol for sage grouse conservation. So in this area, males display this behavior in order to attract females and mate with them. Females select the most attractive males. And it's not only a place for display, it's also a place where antagonistic behavior occurs, where animals tend to push each other away from the center of the lake in order to monopolize this specific spot. The reason is that the males that are able to uh, dominate these territories, maybe stay in the middle of this lake, are actually able to mate with up to 80% of the female <coughs> that are actually visiting the lakes. Uh, currently, Grasslands National Park hosts the only two active lakes for this species in Saskatchewan. Um, males displays of lakes are actually a quite significant tool for conservation biologists because um, because of the appearance of males and their behavior, males are much easier to be spotted and counted uh, than what females are. So park staff uh, can go to advantage point in order to not give any disturbance to the species during this sensitive time of year, count the males, and use male count as an indication of the relative abundance of the population. So by combining this information over time, we are able to give a relative measure of sagebrush population size over time. What you're seeing here are basically the counts of males in Grasslands National Park in the last 20 years. Um, clearly, as expected, also the counts in Grasslands National Park have fallen, uh, according to the decline that we discussed a few minutes ago. Uh, that in 2016 show 80% uh, increase compared to the counts done in 2015, 
and they're actually 4.5 times higher what recorded in 2014. So we are seeing uh, signs of recovery, however, we are clearly far from the historical data in the 90s. Uh, what I'm serving Russell National Park is actually not an isolated uh, system or phenomenon. Uh, in fact, if we look at the data that we just observed for grasslands, and then we take a look at just uh, south of the border, uh, precisely in Valley County, uh, which is in the area just north of the Missouri River and south of the park, it is roughly here. And we look at the population counts they have recorded in the last 20 years. We notice that uh, although the counts are much, much higher in this area, we are talking about roughly 400 males right here, the trends are actually quite comparable. In fact, you can see that the declines in the early 2000s are comparable to and following what we observed in grasslands, followed by a relatively small increase in 2007, and then a quite significant decline again in 2012, 2013, followed by the last few years of recovery. So this does somehow suggest that what we see in grasslands is basically somehow a spillover of a situation that can happen uh, on a larger scale, perhaps including, of course, the areas just south of the border. And this observation are somehow uh, matched by knowledge on the behavior of um, hens. Uh, research done on radio tracking showed that female that nested in Canada in spring and summer were actually going to overwinter south of the Milky River, north of the Missouri and Montana. Therefore, further emphasizing that uh, landscape connectivity on large scale is very relevant, and so is um, coordinated effort for recovery of these species across uh, countries. Now, another key um, part of the uh, species life cycle is represented by nesting and rearing. Um, Optimal habitat for nesting and brood rearing uh, somehow has characteristics that are related to the needs of the hens and their chicks uh, in terms of cover from predators and food. Uh, the measure that we have right here are coming from literature and research done uh, in the United States. Uh, those are values that we use as an uh, indication of what can be considered optimal habitat. Sagebrush cover around 10 to 25 percent, height of the sagebrush between 40 and 80 centimeters, grass cover around 15 percent, grass, grass height around 18 centimeters, for book cover around 10 percent. We have to keep in mind that these data are actually coming from, um, from areas where uh, vegetation community are slightly different, so not necessarily transportable to Canada. However, this can be still used as a reference when we talk about habitat quality. Now, if we look at the habitat quality, for sage grass in Grasslands National Park, just in the proximity <coughs> of the two lakhs that we discussed earlier, we notice that some of those habitat characteristics are actually quite lower, or quite far compared to the optimal uh, measure that we discussed. Now, improving quality for sage grass nesting and brood rearing is currently considered the most powerful tool for the conservation of this species because it can positively impact. Uh, that segment of the, of, the, uh, of the life cycle of the species that has the highest impact on population recruitment and therefore population recovery. So now it's my pleasure to leave the stage to Laura who will tell you what Rassens is doing to improve habitat of sage grass in the park. Um, so I'm going to talk about our habitat enhancement program, which is actually fairly new. Uh, our first field season was in 2016. And uh, the project actually consists of two components. The first of which is the experimental component, which is being done by a graduate student from the University of Alberta. That's Autumn Watkinson, she's right here. Um, and then that it consists of, she's got a series of experimental plots in the park and she's looking at the best or she's researching the best methods to uh, restore silver sagebrush habitat. Um, and then the second component is the large-scale um, landscape enhancement and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So first I just wanted to explain the difference between these two terms or at least how the park is using them and why I'm calling it enhancement 
not restoration. Um, so at the very beginning of the project and the planning stages, the park had to choose between uh, whether we were going to take low quality habitats such as crested wheatgrass fields in the park and try to restore it back to what would likely be moderate habitat or take moderate quality habitat that just needs maybe a little bit more forbs or a little bit more sagebrush or something like that and make it high quality habitat. Um, and so we chose to do the latter of those two things at least to start with um, and so that's why we're referring it to enhancement because we're enhancing habitat that has sub-optimal quality and trying to make it optimal quality based on the targets that Stefano mentioned in his presentation. Um, so once we had that decided, we uh, tried to choose some sites in the park based on the landscape scale. And we did that to start with using GIS. Um, so we took layers like uh, critical habitat for greater sage grouse, so that's kind of this faded looks almost green on the screen actually. Um, color in the background, we looked at sagebrush occupancy in the park, or at least from a rough layer that we had. This is sort of this more solid green color. And then we looked at sage gross um, observations in the park to see where, where in the park the birds are. Um, and we, we did that to try and find parts of the park to enhance that would be of most benefit to the sage gross. And we also looked at things like grazing regimes, uh, fire history, accessibility of sites, and then also other values in the park. So where the black-tailed prey dog colonies are um, and where sites were that may be important to visitor experience, fire, asset. We took all that into account. Then we zeroed in to about a five kilometer buffer around active lex in the park. Um, we did that because According to the literature, about 70% of hens will nest and rear their young within five kilometers of Lex. Um, and so based on all of that criteria for West Block, we chose to enhance this area in spring 2017. And then for East Block, we did went through a similar process. East Block presents a few unique challenges, one of which is access for people and equipment. Um, and two, also we have much higher levels of litter in the East Block, which, pr which can present challenges for the method of enhancement that you choose to use. Um, despite all that, this year we chose this area to enhance, and I'll be coming back to that in a few slides. So once we did that landscape scale selection of selecting a few potential areas, for enhancement. Uh, the University of Alberta came down and they did some site reconnaissance in the field. They visited these areas and um, to see if they could be potential sites for enhancement. Things that we looked at were species presence, so what types of species were present at the site for grass, forbs, shrubs. Uh, also looked for invasives to see if there were any invasives that we might have to deal with during the enhancement <laughs> process. Um, also percent cover, different types of grass, forbs, and uh, sagebrush, other shrubs. Um, looked at soil type and litter to try and predict challenges for uh, which enhancement method we might choose for those particular sites. And then also accessibility um, to the sites. Once the sites were chosen, um, then we just started to discuss what type of enhancement methods we would use. One method that you can use is seeding. Uh, for seeds, however, what we wanted were native species that were collected um, in a local area to the park. Um, we wanted wild collected species and we wanted to maintain the diversity that we need to create sage grouse habitat. And the challenge with that is the availability of those types of seeds on the market is very limited. Um, so we did do some collection <coughs> ourselves this year. Uh, we did some hand collection um, of grass or of forbs and sagebrush and then we also collected some grass species with the um, pull type seed stripper here. So some challenges with the seed collection we had was that it was very labor intensive, um, scouting out locations of sizable patches that were worth 
going out to collect um, was a challenge. Getting the quantities that we needed to do that large scale enhancement through wild collection without um, taking too much away from what the park needs. Um, and then diversity, so getting the number of species that we wanted. Uh, we started out targeting 14 species, so finding enough patches of the right size of 14 species was challenging, at least for the Forbes. Um, and then we had seven species of grass we were looking for, and then the sagebrush. And then also weeds were a challenge as always, um, not so much with the hand collection, but definitely with the seed stripper. Um, trying to avoid Canada thistle and curly dock and all those things. And then if we wanted to try and offset some of those labor intensive costs by trying to purchase at least a little bit of seed, that was still a challenge. Um, once we did collect seeds, we would lay them out to dry for grass and sagebrush. We had enough seed that we were laying them out on tarps. Um, for Forbes, this year our lovely asset crew built us a Forb drying shelf. Um, it's very similar to the one shown here from Last Mountain Lake. Um, I chose this picture because it actually shows how the seed fits into it, so it's very nice. Um, so we'll have that for next year to maximize organization and efficiency for drying our 14 Forbes species, which will be very nice. Um, so after the drying process and we would clean the seeds, um, the main two points I wanted to get across with this slide was the diversity of seeds that we cleaned this year and that it was all done by hand. Um, so it was a very slow process, took a lot of effort, hours, um, a lot of creative methods, especially with the Forbes seeds because we cleaned everything from light and fluffy to seeds with a very thick shell on them. Um, this is a picture of Nils here cleaning some sagebrush seed. He's rubbing it, rubbing the branches uh, against a screen, and then the seed is falling out down into the tote below. And then once the seeds are clean, we need to store them. And with native seeds, at least, um, if you store them in a 10 degree cold room, um, they can lose up to 10% of their viability per year. Um, if you freeze them, then they will lose only 1% to 2% of their viability per year. Um, so, but we don't have unlimited freezer space is the challenge. Um, so grass and the sagebrush seed we're keeping in the cold room and the forbs, since we have small amounts of them and we put so much effort into cleaning them, um, we're going to try and store them in a freezer. So seeds aren't the only enhancement method that you can use. You can also plant plugs. We did that in East Block this year through a volunteer event. Um, we had 18 volunteers show up for the event and three students from the University of Alberta, including the graduate student who's doing the research component of this, and also four Parks Canada staff. So together we put in 586 effort hours and planted 3,000 sage plugs. And then we also combined the volunteer event volunteer event with some fence marking, which is another method for improving sage grouse habitat. Um, so I just thought to throw this in here. Um, what we do is we put these three inch pieces of vinyl siding on fence wires, and it increases the visibility of those fence wires and reduces risk of uh, collision by sage grouse by up to 83%. And that's according to this paper right here. Um, and we marked over 11 kilometers of fence in the volunteer program as well. For those who are interested, most of our volunteers came from Saskatchewan and Alberta, but we did get a few international volunteers through the Dixon crew uh, who decided to, to come help us with some of the fence marking. Here are some pictures from this year's <coughs> event. It went over really well. We got all 3,000 sage plugs in the ground, uh, which was great. Um, for anyone who's interested, we will be having the event again in 2017. So if you're interested in coming out, just uh, pay attention to our website and we'll be posting it in the spring sometime. So all that being said, uh, seeding and planting plugs um, aren't the only methods you can use for enhancement. You can also improve sage grouse habitat by um, reintroducing uh, ecosystem processes onto the landscape, such as grazing. And with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Nathan.
Okay, thanks, Laura. So I'm going to be talking about the relationship between grazing and sage growth habitat. So, a little bit of background to the grazing management program at Grasslands. <clears throat> grazing is an important ecological process, and Grasslands has an objective to restore this process to the landscape. Now, bison are the preferred species of grazer in the park, but we do use livestock as well to replicate this process in areas of the park where we simply don't yet have the capacity to manage for bison. So one of the reasons that grazing is such an important process, uh, regardless of the species, is just the fact that grazing changes wildlife habitat. Certain species are adapted to use habitat that has been grazed in a certain way. So this figure kind of illustrates that concept nicely by showing a range of grassland bird species and their habitat requirements in the context of a gradient of habitat structure. So there are certain, certain species that require short, sparse grass and certain species that require taller, denser grass. So this map shows what we refer to as the greater park ecosystem. So Valmarie is the red star. The park holdings are shown in green. The brown layer are PFRAs and community pastures. And also included in that ecosystem is a lot of privately managed uh, lease land, native grass, that's not shown here on the map. But within this greater ecosystem, the primary land use is grazing of domestic livestock. And so conventional livestock grazing creates a certain type of habitat that certain types of species use, many species use. But at the same time, there are certain species that their habitats are underrepresented under conventional grazing management. So what we try to do within the park is ensure that those habitat types are represented on the landscape. So what exactly goes into managing for a habitat type? Well, at a very basic level, you can think of a habitat as the ecosite. So those are things like slope or soil type that determines what has the potential to grow there and disturbance. So that impacts what actually grows there and its structure. So in grasslands, we target two ecosites specifically for management. The first is upland grasslands. And here we manage for areas of high structure, such as are used by the Sprague's pipit, and areas of low structure, such as are used by the chestnut colored longspur. So again here, you've got the ecosite, which is your upland grassland. And then you've got your disturbance, which in the case of the high structure habitat is light grazing or the absence of fire. The second ecosite that we manage for are sagebrush communities. So these are typically found places like alluvial flats with poorer soils, high sagebrush cover. And here we manage for the greater sage growths. And I'll get into more detail later as to what that habitat looks like. So if we're aiming to have all three of these habitat types represented within the park, we have to manage for different things in different places. So, sorry, these are the park holdings, but not all of the park holdings are fenced in a way that's suitable for grazing. So this map shows all the fences within the park, and each fence area forms a discrete grazing block in which we can apply a certain type of management. So the question is, where do we manage for what? So the first thing you need to consider would be the presence of the ecosite. You can't manage for a certain habitat type if the ecosite isn't there to begin with. This map shows the distribution of upland habitats within the park. And alongside it, this map shows the distribution of sagebrush habitats within the park. And another really important factor you have to consider is what is the likelihood that a species is going to use a given area? So this map shows each of the leks, uh, one of the west block and one of the east block, along with the 10 kilometer buffer around it. So we're using a larger buffer here than Laura used for her enhancement project, simply because with grazing, we can affect more area with less resources. So if we only consider those grazing blocks that contain a high proportion of sagebrush habitat within the 10 meter radius, we can, that can help us identify what blocks are most appropriate or highest priority for sage growth management. So what exactly is sage growth management? What is the habitat that we want to create there looks like? Well, we want to manage for nesting and early brood rearing. And during these life stages, there are two really important uh, habitat components. The first is cover, which in this ecosystem is really provided for by tall grass. And the second is food, particularly for young broods who rely almost exclusively on forbs and invertebrates. So this gets back to the idea of how does grazing change habitat? Well, if an area is left completely without grazing for a long time, it'll become almost exclusively dominated by tall grass, 
so you'll have an abundance of cover there, but foraging opportunities might be more scarce. Now in a landscape where grazing has gone maybe beyond what is suitable for stage growth, you might see the opposite scenario where you have a landscape dominated by short grasses and forbs. There's plenty of foraging opportunities, but cover might be less available. So what we want to manage for is something right in the middle, a landscape where you have foraging opportunities available in close proximity to ungrazed areas that provide good cover. So if this is our target habitat, this habitat will be created under any, almost any type of grazing management just by chance in some areas. But how do we manage in such a way that we achieve this habitat on as large a scale possible? Well, even though we're trying to work towards targets that are different from those of a conventional producer, so in this case it's our specific habitat targets, we still consider a lot of the same factors that a conventional producer would. So things like stocking rate, how many cows are present on the landscape and for how long, season of grazing, cattle will graze different parts of the landscape depending on the season. So for example, cattle may graze closer to water in the summer and they'll graze parts of the landscape that are farther away from the water in the winter and early spring. We also consider manipulation methods which allow managers to achieve more fine scale control. So things like electric fences, strategic use of water sources, and riders. And most importantly, we need to monitor vegetation so we know what's happening out there. So this is an image of Grasslands Park staff uh, doing vegetation monitoring using a Robel pole, which is an objective method for measuring the amount of hiding cover in an area. So not all of these components may be 100% under your control necessarily. What components we can control, if you want to understand that, you also need to take a step back and understand what types of administrative approaches the park has at its disposal. So the first approach we use is what we refer to as a prescription-based approach. So this is a more basic approach. Step one is to collect field measurements based on the type of vegetation or what the, what the vegetation out there looks like. Grasslands develops a prescription that includes things like the stocking rate and season. It issues a call for tenders that local producers can bid on and the successful bidder provides the cattle. So one drawback of this approach is simply the lag time. So the lag time between monitoring and management often monitoring in one field season and managing in the next. But it can be suitable for small scale or short term management objectives when you just need something simple and straightforward. So another approach that we use that's a bit more complex but can be very effective is a results based approach. So here the stock manager is a lot more involved in decision making. Um, they're responsible for making frequent assessments of habitat on the landscape and modifying their management accordingly. So again this is the target we're shooting for and if the stock manager sees that things are starting to look a little bit more like either of the extremes, we know we need to modify our management. And that's the big advantage of this approach, is just the faster response. You see what's happening on the landscape, and you manage accordingly immediately. So this type of approach works really well in large-scale operations. Here, the stock managers just have more room to work with, which gives them more options and more flexibility to help them achieve the habitat targets in priority areas. And it also works well in long-term operations where the stock manager has an incentive to kind of buy in and invest in a new way of thinking about managing grass. And it also gives an opportunity for cattle to become conditioned to grazing in an area that might be unfamiliar with them, so that, which makes cattle quite a bit easier to control. So now I'm going to talk about a specific project um, that's happening in the park that takes this concept a step further and uh, helps us manage using a results-based approach not only on parkland but on some neighboring lands as well. So the situation here is the east block of the park, the area around the fire guard lek. The green holdings show grazing blocks that are, would be prioritized for sage growth management and the blue layer just shows the sagebrush habitat itself. The red dot is the lek. <clears throat> and as you can see here the holdings are quite fragmented. We've got multiple different holdings that are separated spatially. So this makes man management decisions more complex. First of all, Managing each holding individually requires more infrastructure. So, for example, for each holding of the landscape, you have to consider whether or not water sources are present. And additionally, additionally the perimeter of each block needs to be fenced in its entirety. Um, and the situation here is that the park holdings, um, the land in between them, consists of a single large, or a large lease managed by a single, uh, single manager. So our options here essentially are to manage the park blocks individually, maybe using a prescription-based approach, or to find a way to 
include the neighbor in on the project. And if we do that, there's actually a lot of benefits, especially if it means that we can include um, some of the sagebrush habitat that exists on the neighbor's land in our results-based framework and ultimately improve or optimize more habitat for sagebrush. So this is what we're moving towards. Um, it's the idea of managing a large unit together under a results-based framework. Some of the advantages that we get out of this system, well, the large size just simply gives us a, lots of, a lot of flexibility to work with. You've got more options and more, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Um, with a certain number of cattle within this management unit, in a wet year, it might take longer to reach your habitat targets than it would in a dry year. So if you have a wet year, you have to make the choice about um, whether you are going to get close to your targets at a large area or meet your targets in a shorter area, because you might not have the option to actually bring more cattle into the management unit. So with a large area, we have enough cattle on the landscape that we can make the choice to move them in to an area, higher priority area, closer to the lack, and make sure that we achieve the habitat in the way we want in that high priority area. Another big option is that, or pardon me, another big advantage is that infrastructure requirements are really reduced. So for example, we're able to drop or even remove fences that cross priority areas of sage grouse habitat. So highlighted in red here are a few areas where we now have that opportunity. And what I think is the biggest advantage is that the scale of the operation is large enough <clears throat> that it can support a dedicated livestock slash habitat manager who can be there on the landscape making frequent visits, evaluating um, where we are with respect to the habitat targets and modifying management accordingly. So what our livestock management looks like? We use a light moderate stocking rate uh, and a rest rotation system <clears throat> and the livestock manager provides fine scale control to, discard, to target specific discrete areas of sagebrush um, that are the boundaries between our natural watershed limits as opposed to fences. So this animation kind of gives you an idea of what rotation might look like in a typical year with cattle being moved from one watershed unit to another with the season. And again, the decision to move cattle is not based, it's not predetermined. It's based on whether or not the habitat targets have been met. So again, if you have a wet year, it might take longer to reach these habitat targets than it would in a dry year, and the riders can make the decision to keep cattle within a management unit for a longer period accordingly. So for, in order for this to work, the livestock manager needs to be well trained in what the habitat targets look like. And we achieve this by including them on the data collection process for the park's monitoring program. So what the monitoring program calls for is data collection at permanent sites throughout the management unit. Collect data at a 100 meter transect, and every meter along the transect, measurement of grass height is made, and whether or not the vegetation was grazed in that year is recorded. So transect sites where between 20 and 40 percent of the vegetation was removed are considered to have met the target. And this number comes from literature which uh, success suggests a maximum rate of vegetation removal of 40 percent for as a sage growth best management practice. So having the riders participate in this monitoring pro uh, participate, pardon me, in this monitoring process helps them understand the targets so they know what they're shooting for and it makes it more likely for them to achieve the targets. And at the same time, this data is documented and prepared in an annual progress report prepared by Parks Canada. So this is a relatively new program. 2016 was the first year. <clears throat> and grazing in 2016 was focused on the lands in the west end of the management unit. So private lands as well as grassland lands at the east end of the management unit were minimally grazed in 2016. This map shows the location of approximately 40 monitoring sites throughout the management unit. And this chart here shows the data broken down between the three watersheds that you see there. So um, the data for this watershed is actually has quite a large range in the percent of area that was grazed at the different monitoring sites. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention that these two blue lines correspond to the lower and upper thresholds of our habitat targets. So again, at this watershed in the bottom right here, there's quite a large range in the measurements, which suggests that cattle were not evenly distributed throughout the landscape. Some parts of the watershed were being grazed heavier than others. And the reason why it's important to monitor these things is because this ties into our management approaches in, few, in coming years. Obviously, we need to make sure that the distribution of grazing throughout that particular watershed is more even, so we're achieving more optimal habitat on more area. 
So this column here shows the data for the watershed in the top right. So there's actually quite a smaller range to this data and it's not too far off our lower threshold there. So that indicates that the distribution of grazing is actually quite even and we're not too far off of our targets. So we can call that watershed a, a bit more of a success for sure. Um, and this watershed here, um, the impact of grazing was actually quite low. Most of the monitoring measurements were below 5%. So we really had a hard time having any impact at all in that area. This really goes back to the concept of conditioning cattle to being in a new environment. These cattle are accustomed to spending time on private lands to the east of what's shown on the map. Um, so what that means is the farther west you want them to move, the harder it is. So hopefully in a longer term arrangement, arrangement these cattle will become conditioned uh, to grazing this new part of the landscape and will have better success meeting our habitat targets there in the future. So just to wrap up this part of the presentation, um, there's a lot of factors that need to be considered when you're using livestock grazing to manage for habitat for a specific species. Uh, the more tools you have at, the at your disposal and the more these different factors are under your control, the more likely you are to have success. So that's why the most successful approaches are likely going to be those that incorporate A, the practical experience of local producers who know how to use conventional livestock management methods to achieve somewhat unconventional results and science-based science -based decision making, which allows you to define clear objectives and monitor your success. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Nils. We've talked a lot so far about how we manage vegetation for sage growth, and Nils is going to talk about another important ecosystem component, which is predation. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, last but not least, we'll see. <laughs> Um, so habitat quality also includes predation. Um, nest predation is documented to be the leading cause of greater sage grouse nest failure. So this past, there goes. this past season we conducted a study documenting the predation of artificial greater sage grouse nests in the park. Our objectives were to estimate rates of predation as well as identify species most likely to predate greater sage grouse nests. Now, um, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge a couple of people. Uh, Samantha Fisher was heavily involved with setting up the study, and Heather Olson uh, was involved with uh, the GIS component, so selecting nest sites. Um, so in total, we set up 32 nests throughout the park. Uh, nests were selected according to a restricted randomization protocol. Meaning, uh, nests are randomly selected, however they need to be within a three kilometer buffer of a lek, need to be 300 meters apart, and within sage grouse nesting habitat. Um, we have four different sites, each with eight uh, nests with cameras set up around them. Two sites were uh, located in the west block, two in the east block. Uh, two sites were surrounding active leks, two sites were surrounding inactive leks and uh, the sites were set up over two week periods um, uh, during the month of May to coincide with the sage grouse nesting period. I'll get through this stuff quick so you can see what was actually eating the eggs. Uh, nest and camera setup. I won't go into too much detail surrounding our nest methodology. However, oh it's like backwards on this one. Um, seven chicken eggs uh, were set up under cover of sagebrush, uh, sufficient to hide the nest from visual predators. The chicken eggs were rubbed with gross scent and placed in a grass nest with sage grouse feathers. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and we deployed remote ca cameras about three and a half to four meters away from the nest uh, at about 50 centimeters height. And this was through a process of trial and error. We found that at this distance, we, we could actually see uh, the eggs as well as any predators approaching the nest. So we try to minimize human scent at the site by accessing the site only once, wearing rubber gloves and rubber boots, and putting uh, all our equipment on tarps. At the end of the two weeks at each site, um, we took pictures of the nest remains. Um, I guess we, we took, took down our cameras. And uh, one, one other thing that we did was we, 
in case some of our cameras didn't produce any pictures for us, we wanted to be able to document what predator uh, predated each nest. So um, we recorded physical indicators of nest remains to give us an idea of which predator predated each nest. We used a method developed by Sargent for identifying predators based on nest remains uh, from work he did with uh, duck nests. So indicators that we recorded included size or like damage to shells, so size, uh, location of holes in the shells, uh, how the shells, where the shells were, how many were left in the nest, how the shells were scattered, any yolk residue left on the shells or shell fragments left at the nest, and any digging or disturbance around the nest site. Uh, for our analysis, we tallied total nests predated and compared nests uh, predated in the west and uh, by, by area in Lex, so west versus east block, um, as well as active versus inactive Lex. We then went through all of the remote camera photos uh, to get an idea of, or, or to know which predator predated each nest and when. And since we didn't have camera, uh, camera evidence or, or photos for each nest, um, we used our physical indi indicators that we recorded from our observations and nest remains to give us an idea of which predator predated each nest. Then using a combination of both sets of data, uh, we developed three categories of evidence. Certain, where we actually saw the predation happen on camera. Likely where investigative behavior was caught on camera, combined with uh, physical indicators indi indicating that the same species predated the nest. And non-excludable, uh, where we didn't get any camera data, but the physical indicators indicated that it could be a certain species. And then since some of our nests had instances of multiple predation, we created uh, categories of, or we assigned categories of primary, secondary, and even in some cases tertiary to each instance or each predation occurrence to give us an idea of which predator had the most impact. So the next couple photos are the same nest with multiple predation. Uh, it's first predated here by a magpie, the primary predator, and then again by the coyote uh, as a secondary predator. So in total, 13 of the 32 nests were predated. Actually, 14 were damaged, but in one case, eggs were crushed by a bison. Wow. Um, seven nests were predated in the west block, six in the east block. As we expected, there was no significant difference there. However, if we look at active uh, versus inactive lex, 11 uh, nests were predated surrounding active lex, and only two were predated surrounding inactive lex. Um, so, uh, uh, predation surrounding active lex was significantly higher than inactive. Why? Uh, we don't have a clear answer yet, but uh, we think that maybe because uh, there's more sage grouse activity surrounding active lex, this could draw predators in. For our species specific analysis, we included only primary predation and uh, certain and likely evidence. So therefore, we were only able to reliably identify the predator for eight out of the 13 nests. Um, five out of six of our nests in the east block, um, we didn't get camera data for. Four of them were knocked over by cattle grazing in the area, and so we don't have a very complete picture of predation in the east block. However, if we look at predation in the park as a whole, and we uh, group uh, magpies and crows into one category uh, under the taxon corvids, we see that corvids predated six of the eight nests, while coyote and badger were reported for one predation occurrence each. And although our, our sample size is quite small, we did compare proportions of nests predated by each species, and the likelihood of predation by corvids is significantly higher than um, the other species. So uh, this year was a pilot project. We were kind of learning as we went. Um, we now have a pretty good idea of nest setup, so camera height and, and distance, uh, nest methodology. We know we'd like to expand the study next year to include maybe 64 nests, so doubling the size, um, just so we can collect more data and conduct a more meaningful analysis. Um, I guess we know that we need to kind of streamline the physical evidence data collection and analysis to make it a little bit less cumbersome. And it'd be good if we could work with grazing or find a method of uh, 
changing our site selection and site setup to make it a little bit more resistant to cattle so not as many cameras are knocked over next year. Um, so although preliminary, our study uh, confirms corvids as major predators of artificial greater sage grouse nests, uh, indicating a risk to real greater sage grouse nests. The next step is to continue monitoring <coughs> corvid populations as well as documenting rates of predation on nests. The presence of corvids has also been uh, associated with anthropogenic subsidies, so things like old buildings, perches, old dumps. So identifying these subsidies and finding ways to reduce them in sage grouse nesting habitat is another important first step. And I'll hand it over to Stefano to take us home. Listo. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we really hope now that you can have a better feeling of what all these different activities and projects on sagebrush in the park are about. Um, and our even more important hope is that you can now appreciate how uh, recovery of sagebrush is a really complex challenge where uh, not a single tool or not a single action can be used as a solution. In fact, what this perhaps more requires is a uh, uh, science-based program that really has been involved in multi, uh, several actions on the ground, including um, population monitoring, uh, research, as well as habitat management. Um, and if I can add, if we can add another element, is that uh, Sejugo's autumn is only a piece of a very complex mosaic and ecosystem that we uh, need to protect and preserve in the long term. Uh, and if I can select only one message that I could, uh, we could leave you with is that because of the complexity of, the, of this mosaic and this ecosystem, uh, it's not really about uh, protecting or focusing on any individual species. Uh, our approach, in fact, requires to take a look at a bird picture and therefore focusing on protection and restoration of entire ecosystems, uh, equilibria and processes, because only in this way is possible to uh, create a meaningful restoration and uh, conservation of a very delicate and endangered uh, landscape. Um, with that, we certainly have a lot of partners and collaborators to thank. Uh, they have been key players with us in this program, uh, and they will keep being uh, partners in this uh, near future. Uh, and of course, we really thank you for coming and uh, listening to us, and we'll be very happy to take any question at this point. Suggestion. I think we should have a show in our gallery of some stills from the camera. Like, that's freaking art, man. Yeah. Anyway, and I'm saying that, I'm, I'm also saying that as a wonderful way to get the scientists who work on this stuff integrated in the people who come in to learn about the area. That's also part of what this area is about, is what you're doing up there. And I find what's difficult sometimes, to be honest, is I'm trying to stay up with what you're presenting and you're still throwing the science language and you're not defining what those terms mean but mm -hmm. I kind of know what you mean and I'm just wondering um, if there's a way to tell this story that's so fascinating uh, a little more anecdotally just so I can stay up with you that keep up with you that's just sort of like there's some like procedural things that mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what you're saying and I've missed time on what else you're saying. So as as an academic myself, I in C V C we say don't don't uh, just just I don't mean dumb it down but keep it I I don't mean to be critical because it's no, really, good. really fascinating. But I I, I want to see more locals here mm -hmm. and I know that that's part of the frustration is that there's a common language that I'm like I wanna know more about sure. and I just want to make one observation. It's fascinating that I don't know when, you can tell me, when did they actually start, when did the numbers start to go down? Was it when the park started? Because it's interesting to see exactly how much was cattle grazing actually keeping the lex alive 
because yeah. now the solution is to bring the cattle back in. And I find that an amazing full circle. I think one of the problems with sage grouse is that it's kind of across the board. So it's not like their presentation today was very specific to the park, but the population like in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Montana is declining everywhere. Um, so it's, it shouldn't be affiliated with, with the starting of the park or, or anything, but you can probably Or well, maybe just that the that's grazing a, is helping. That's yeah. a good rancher question. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, thanks for the comments. We welcome criticism at any time because it's constructive. So I do see the point of in certain situation to ease the language if possible. So we'll certainly make an effort for that. Uh, I don't know what restricted randomized protocol means for instance and I'm sure that there's a common term. That's just an example. And you don't even have to define it to me because I know I know I can do a simultaneous translation in my head. I'm just not yeah. sure a lot of people would want to. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so instead, to answer your final question, um, like many species at risk, often there is not one single cause. And often there's a combination of factors that all play together, and this is shared you know, with sage-grouse, boring owls, and many other species. So for sage-grouse, the main uh, causes recognized for species decline is, first of all, habitat loss. We, we, we change the landscape, we change the habitat, we alter it. We have 30% of the native great plains that are gone. That's the number one. Um, we have a habitat fragmentation, which means that even when we have habitat, it might be not good enough because they're not connected to each other. So animals cannot move within patches of habitat, and therefore that's another bottleneck that you're inputting. Uh, and of course, there may be other factors, including diseases, um, disturbance from human, human activity, gas, gas development creates um, acoustic disturbance that it's not uh, welcome because of the needs of the species during the lack. There are so many other factors that are playing into it. So what you though pointed out is, I think is a great point, meaning that sometimes we think that protecting and creating no disturbance is good. In, in fact, it's not true. In fact, there is a theory in ecology that says Zero disturbance is almost as bad as too much disturbance, and we sometimes need to create that sweet spot, and that's where grazing as a disturbance comes in. So having grazers on the landscape is good, and I think that uh, you probably heard even Wes talk in the past, talking about how bison grazing has positive effects on the landscape. Now, we lost bison because, again, of our impact, and so now, in some cases, we are lucky that we do have bison on the landscape, but we can't yet have them on all the landscape. And so, in some cases, the park can reintroduce grazing where and manage it in a way that it's, if you want, more sustainable for so, so for certain habitat targets that support species at risk. Does this answer your yeah, question? Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? I know of three lakes that are in the park. What can you do for them? One is is uh, very near a grid road, mm -hmm. and if you want to go see the lake, you just go in your vehicle. You don't have to get out or anything. You just and they're doing their performance, their dancing. I mean, it's great if you take kids out and all that sort of thing. But uh, knowing the uh, extreme situation that they're under. Is there anything we can do for them? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm also welcoming any other input from perhaps people that are sitting here. I don't want to monopolize the answer uh, stage, but I think it's safe to say that really no other species is um, right now so spoiled, if I can use this term, as it was, meaning that uh, um, a specific protection uh, came into place because of the extreme need for it. And this is, in our common language, uh, referred to as the emergency protection order, mm -hmm. which really limits disturbance activity during a specific time of the year, during a specific time of the day, and so on. So the, the park, but in general, the species is very protected. Right. Uh, but protection on the spot is only one piece. So right now what we're trying to do is not only protect those lacks and having uh, them 
protecting the long term, but it's also having the population uh, being productive, so uh, having um, good population recruitment so that new lacs can be recolonized. So the park used to have up to 13 or so lacs that now are not used, at least only two of them are used. So our hope is that as the population increases, more lacs will be used, there will be uh, a curve where the population is going to go up. So as far as the protection on the spot, I think we really do everything we can, but there's clearly more than that. Mm. Does that I, answer yeah, your question? Answered my question and a uh, very knowledgeable presentation. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, sure. like, first of all, I had no idea like this amazing and innovative research was like going on in my backyard. So I think it's really cool what you guys are doing, and I'm I'm just blown away. Um, but I guess my question is like, what next? What are you planning for for 2017 and and into the future? Um. Well, uh, I, I would say that um, everything you saw today is to be interpreted in a long-term scale. Uh, I think probably the, the project, the program that fits the most this definition is the grazing program, meaning that that's a type of habitat management that does not give results after a few months. It will give results after a few years. So. What thing that we certainly need to do though is monitoring population response, which means you're changing habitat, you are hoping to meet your target, but you still want to see whether a population positively responds. And I think that's our key component. So we'll keep doing population monitoring as well as uh, basically monitoring if you, if I can use the term, effectiveness monitoring, which means how good your management is in terms of returns for your population. So that's where we are going next. And uh, again, the hope is that those bars that you see for population numbers will go up. But of course, uh, it does not depend only on grasslands. And I think one effort that uh, we need to do is talk more and collaborate more, uh, even more than what we currently do with um, people uh, that manage habitat and population across the border. because. As I hope you also understood, is not just grassland. It's a larger uh, habitat that needs to be managed accordingly. So we need to make sure that decisions that we take on this side of the border are not at least coordinated, are coordinated with decision strategies that are decided on the other side. Oh, that's really interesting. Are you going to the transboundary workshop in January? I don't know. <laughs> so how much longer then will you get to stay? Me, Stefan? Yeah, yeah. yeah you step. <laughs> uh, as much as I can. <laughs> but it, because it's that long term. I mean, it's yeah. not, yeah. Did I understand you correctly that the sage grouse migrates to the southern, or yep. depending either north or south of the Missouri? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I see, I didn't know that. You have a question? Yeah, so two quick questions. Uh, first, with your, your grazing management strategies, you said that you prefer to use bison for grazing over livestock. So what's the rationale behind that? And then also with the, the habitat adjustment, using different grazing strategies, have you seen an increase or decrease in other species at risk that would be using those areas? Okay. I think I'll answer the first question and I'll leave Nathan answering the second question. Um, the rationale to say bison is better, <clears throat> I would say, is because it's the natural grazer for that landscape. And maybe Wes has a different opinion, but um, it's, not, it's not to say that cattle is not desirable. It's just to say that uh, to restore the native ecosystems, uh, bison is the preferred species simply because it's what made that ecosystem naturally. Of course, now we need to work on eco ecological terms is often called proxies, so the thing that m closely resemble that, and cattle, although still different, they are very close to bison, so uh, that's an excellent tool to mimic what bison could do. You want to ask <coughs> your question? Sure. So I think your question was, with the changes in grazing management, have we seen any effects on other species that might be benefiting or not so from increasing grazing? Yeah, so increase or decrease. Well, yeah, 
depending on the type of grazing management, um, when we're monitoring, when we're managing specifically forest species, that's where we monitor most. So I think I touched on in the beginning that we uh, managed for a couple of upland songbird species. So we've definitely seen uh, monitor, or we've done monitoring of our management activities where we've tried specifically to create that high structure or low structure habitat in an upland environments. And where we have done that, yes, we've seen increases in the population size, the amount of species using those areas. Uh, when it comes to the management we're doing specifically for sage grouse, um, when we're managing specifically for sage grouse, we typically focus our monitoring on what's happening in the context of what sage grouse need. But at the same time, we're acknowledging that um, the type of grazing we're applying, which is kind of a light, moderate approach, um, grazing is occurring lightly in the valley bottoms, but very lightly on the uplands. We're kind of, uh, we're able to safely say that the management we're applying there is not likely to be detrimental to any species using other habitats. If anything, we're just introducing a little bit of grazing to those uplands areas, which should be beneficial even for those species that require a high habitat. Even a little bit of, literature shows that even a little bit of grazing is beneficial for them. So. And it, hope that answers your question somewhat. If, yeah. if I can add one layer, which is probably the background, is that in 2016 the park has signed what is called a multi-species action plan, which aims to protect several species out of those 19 that you see, mm -hmm. those are in that action plan. And the goal, and that's uh, what Nathan is doing, is basically uh, allocate grazing across the entire area in a way that we are sure to benefit all those species. So it's very hard to make choices sometimes because uh, sometimes grazing may be easier in one way, but then you have species distribution in another way. But the goal of the park is really targeting all the species. And we have active monitoring programs that we haven't talked simply because we were focusing on sage grouse. But for example, we'll be monitoring uh, a variety of grass and songbird species so that we can actually see the response of those species to grazing over time. And I don't know if you were here for Sam's presentation a month ago. She actually has uh, done research specifically looking at the response of grassland uh, songbirds to grazing. So I invite you to perhaps chat with her as well because she might have good answers as well. <laughs> Two questions. Yeah. Um, is there a difference in the Prediction rates on artificial versus natural nests, and what kind of difference is there? And is there a difference in mortality rates for sage grouse that migrate long distance versus residential birds that stay? I can try to first one. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question uh, related to artificial versus real sage grouse nests. Um, there is there's some criticism for, for using artificial nests because uh, some people think that for there's some people think that they don't necessarily accurately reflect real nests. Um, however, how how we set up our study with artificial nests in the proximity of where real nests should be during the period of when uh, sage should be nesting, we think it, it is a fairly good representation of the risk of predation to real nests. Um, there's not a lot of data out there of comparison between real nests and artificial nests, so that's one of the criticisms of using them. But uh, given our study setup, um, yeah, one of our objectives is to get an idea of what's going on up there and what's likely to predate real nests. So. We were privileged uh, this year because we had the opportunity of following um, five hens that were radio tracked. Um, for four of them, it was possible to identify a nest. All of them were predated. So I'm not saying that's meaningful because it's only a sample size of four, but the data we are finding in terms of predation rates do not seem to be really off track. I agree with what Neil said, though, that you always need the real setting to see what happens, but then you're still introducing uh, potential confounding factors. How much is you and your camera attracting predators? 
what can you really do to monitor? Um, one thing that we thought about at the beginning was uh, try to identify the nest of this radio track bird and put a camera, but we decided to be very cautious and not take the chance to attract predators. So we preferred the artificial nest study as a first level of information to see what is more likely to predate and then eventually build from there. But the data that come from the field are already telling us that still predation on real nests is a very uh, critical component. And talking with uh, researchers in Alberta that do work on sage grouse, they have found absolutely comparable results, especially not only in the predation rates, but also in the predators. So Corvids being number one predator uh, of nests. Um, sorry, your second question was... Mortality rates on the nest. That's something, you know, uh, uh, artificial nests are also, yeah, like, like you said, a very non-invasive way of monitoring predation. So for, uh, for a highly uh, sensitive species, that's what that means. Uh, I don't know of specific data for mortality of, um, like I know, <clears throat> I know the data roughly on the mortality rate estimator for hens, but I don't think there is comparison available for what you define as residential. Also because for the real information that we have, if you are using the term uh, residential for the park, we really don't have much evidence of resident bird over the winter. The old information that has been collected over the last 10 years that we have tracked suggests that most of the animals are actually migrating south. And so, and this actually is a very important factor because we, are, we have been talking about nesting and breeding habitat. But one of the things that we want to create is also wintering habitat. So wintering habitat, for example, includes more cover with sage uh, because that's the primary source of food during winter. So we are still thinking of doing some habitat enhancement specifically targeting wintering habitat, but we don't really have evidence yet that that will contribute to uh, the species because we don't know how much, how many of the birds that are coming here in the spring are staying here over winter. Is uh, sage grouse a range of action a possibility? And if we are in the park and see some species at risk, are you interested in knowing if we see them, who do we contact? Like I saw a sage grouse female with four chicks, yep. um, which was to me a privilege. Um, but do you want to know these things? Absolutely. Uh, the sage grouse girl is sitting right uh, on your uh, left, okay. and we do welcome any data because if they are good data, they're always useful. And for the first part of your question, yeah. um, I have nothing against sage grass reintroduction, and I think is a tool. But it's not a tool if you don't have habitat. So if you don't have suitable habitat, there is no point in introducing sage grass. And what we are focusing because of this ecosystem approach that we try to tell you about is we want to focus on good habitat first. Our, we do have sage grouse in the park. Uh, we are not in a situation where we have no sage grouse left and good habitat. We are in a situation in which we have sage grouse, but not enough good habitat. And we believe that if we focus on habitat enhancement and restoration, the population will respond positively to it. Okay. I have a lot of small questions. Yeah. Do you want to answer it, Nils? Yeah, yeah. Almost. Well, I mean, Samantha could probably answer this just as well, but uh, the scent is from Cadell's Remington Girls scent. Yeah. Scent is to train dogs. It's a product that comes from the States. So they train dogs with artificial scents, or, well, I call it artificial because it's done artificially, but includes probably some glands and other um, products that they get. Uh, for the feathers, uh, some of them were collected in the park, meaning they were found in previously occupied nests. Some of them are coming from the Calgary Zoo where there is a, a conservation program with sage grass, so they were able to literally collect from cages um, feathers. Some, actually, some of those feathers were actually coming from the cages used to move hens from Montana to Alberta in our introduction program. And so we were able, through partnerships, to get some of those feathers. So. 
No siege was was killed. <laughs> it's a good question though. Makes you think. Minimizing human scent. I mean, you guys have like a shower every day? Or maybe not. So, you call them Corvette or Corvette? I couldn't quite see the screen. The, the v or V? Corvette. V. 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 Yeah. Corvette. So, <clears throat> if you put out meat in a park, you're going to attract, you know, animals to eat. If you put out nests with eggs, are you not attracting the birds and say, hey, there's lots of meals to be had, there's 32 more nests, why don't you snack on the other four? Like, are you enticing them to show up? Oh, I see what you're saying. So the question would be, how far those corvids come from? Meaning... Um, it's, are you attracting them? No, no, no. Because there's easy meals for them. No, no, I understand what you're saying. So... <clears throat> The way it's set up is that you're aiming to attract corvids that are locally already present. So you're not in, you know, in attracting corvids from, that are not in the area already. You're just trying to measure, actually, how, if you want, how f abundant they are, because you're seeing how easy it is for them to get to your spot. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about what can be the detection rate of an artificial nest that is sitting under a sagebrush for corvids. Millions of years of evolution has taught them to see through that sagebrush. Well, yeah. there it is. So, and then they tell their friends. <laughs> and and that's what we want to measure. So like how likely is... Or something, you see birds circling. There was those birds mm -hmm. weren't there before. All of a sudden they're circling and they just all tell each other. Yeah. And it gets to be a freaking feeding frenzy. I just wondered if the fake nests didn't entice them to stick around longer than they would have. As I said, I know it was only a two week project you said. Right? Sorry? Two, the nests, the fake nests were only out two weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, so yeah and, we, and we long, removed like all their nest remains when we, when we went to pick them up. up. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah, no, it's definitely concerning. And then mm -hmm. my third question, or the fourth, or whatever it was for your grazing, you said the amount of grazing that was optimal was between 20 to 40 percent. Who caught up with that 20 to 40 percent? Where did that come from? We needed to come up with a target <clears throat> for those sagebrush flats kind of close to riparian areas. And a lot of literature suggests best grazing practices for sage rows, um, suggest a maximum rate of forage utilization around 40%. So we definitely wanted to stay under that number, but at the same time, we knew we wanted to impact it a bit, just as previous monitoring had shown that in the park and areas that were left ungrazed, um, we were really deficient, like Stefano touched on at the beginning of this presentation. The amount of forbs present in the ecosystem was quite a bit below our targets. So we knew we wanted to introduce, uh, introduce a bit of disturbance, but we really wanted to keep it under that level of that best ma management practice. And I guess another thing to point out is that we were measuring that rate of utilization in this kind of in the alluvial flats where cattle can be anticipated to spend most of their time. So whatever rate of utilization we were measuring at those sites, um, it was fairly safe to assume that the overall average rate of utilization in the entire management area would be quite a bit lower than that. So we need to work towards a target that gave us uh, an opportunity to make some disturbance, but we just really wanted to keep it uh, in a safe range that we were comfortable with. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, do you see any... Okay, just a question about those plugs first. Where did they come from? Is, you, is that from your guys' seed? It's seed that I collected in the park. And then they and we send it to um, Shannon's greenhouse okay. mm -hmm. in uh, Essendon. And then they grow the plugs for us because they're really good at it. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then we go and get the plugs and we bring it back to Any the success so rate numbers on how that worked out? 96 percent. Oh, they made it? Yeah. It was a wet. Like the, the seeds <laughs> that grew yeah. into plugs in about 96 percent. Oh, I mean, yeah. how many plugs actually took hold and flourished this year? You won't know till next year. We we will be monitoring that, but we might not know for a few years. It seems like if you want to know how many of those plugs became adult plants, that yeah. can take four or five years. Okay, so because they are slow to grow. Um, yeah. So the alluvial flats is that that's preyed on prairie territory too, isn't it? And they're kind of eating the same brush and killing the same brush and sprawling. And is it? Is it bad that they're doing that? Is it affecting the sage grouse? Are they taking that? They are doing their ecological role. 
Pardon? They are doing their ecological role. So. Are they stealing habitat from our. Well, from I wouldn't say stealing. <laughs> they. They may compete for habitat, but uh, again, ecological role of prey dogs is as important as the one of sage grouse. If you look at the number of species that are related to the habitat created by uh, prey dogs, it's impressive. So those are also a keystone species that we need to protect to protect again that mosaic. So the question becomes how much habitat can you manage for prey dogs and how much habitat can you measure for uh, sage grouse in order to have that mosaic, that ecosystem, all those processes present on the landscape in a meaningful way for all the species of risk that you want to protect. How do you control their sprawl if they get too big and kill off that sage grouse which takes so long to grow that big and not plentiful in those flats? I guess the question is um, control I think is possible. Humans have been very good in eradicating things and leading to expiration of mar millions of species. So, and we know that we prey dogs happen already. Uh, so, the prey dog question is, um, when the species goes back to the historical uh, data that we have in the park, that would be a sort of first stepping stone. And then, depending on what happens next, we can decide. We could decide. Uh, what is best for managing habitat according to, again, what's the response of all these different species. We are still not there yet. There's certainly a lot more badgers in the park, even just in the last two years that I've been here. And, and that's good. Yeah, that's an interesting reflection on control yeah. of the prairie dog. But are you, how much, because I can see, obviously, the ecosystem mosaic, the domino effect of one species affecting another. How much do you take into account, and maybe you said it and I was taking notes and didn't hear it, of um, the rise in uh, badger and also that there's a lot of moose sightings now, which haven't been for a while. Do you factor all that in to your data? We do monitor all the data we can, whether those are ready to be used in decision making. I think in those cases not because there are more observations, uh, opportunistic observation rather than collected in a specific way. So, um, but when you see new species coming in or increases, you can always start asking the questions, okay, what does that mean? Partly because I'm saying that because the lek that I know of is across from a wetland where mm -hmm. the moose hang up. And that would definitely cause disturbance. <clears throat> yeah. Again, we don't want to live in a world where sage grouse have a fence around and they can do their things. Uh, there are positive interaction between species and the presence of one often, unless it's a predator, it's potentially a good thing. So before saying, well, is a disturbance, you know, you want to collect good data and we for the specific example you uh, had of moose, we, we are not collecting it on moose simply because we, we are focusing on 19 other priorities. Mm -hmm. And if, though, we have evidence that that could be an effect, that could have an effect, we for sure will be monitoring. So uh, I think, Kelly, you have a question. I don't know if your long-term strategy uh, involves the use of an entomologist. Would be nice. Because uh, the first four weeks of fledglings yep. that, that completely dependent on insects. Yeah. Uh, multiple species are completely dependent on insects. Yeah. Um, I think you're. I'm, I realize the importance of uh, the vegetative structure and and abundance and, and that for uh, cover and a food source. But um, if you're forgetting that. Yeah, no, you're right, and we are not forgetting it. Uh, it was actually originally planned to be one of the questions under um, the experimental component of the habitat restoration that you heard uh, Laura talking about. A uh, specific part was measuring abundance of insects in specific spots to start collecting some data on it. I'm all in favor of collecting data on the insect. Right now, the park has no capacity to do that, but we, what we are definitely uh, looking forward to 
is to collaborate with people that want to do research on insects, as well as other species or taxonomic groups. So I wish we could control the number of um, ecologists or um, of any type that could benefit, and unfortunately we can't. So we need to find good ways and smart ways to get the same information with the resources we have. And we will be taking any opportunity to do that. So would that opportunity lie uh, below the border, say, in Montana, with um, some of the work with SGI and, and uh, Montana State, Bozeman State University? I believe they have an entomologist work on this stuff. Yeah, and we heard about um, some potentials to study insects uh, in collaboration with other partners. So it's something that has been floating around, hasn't started yet, hasn't you know be really triggered uh, full speed. But um, again, if we find the opportunity, we'll certainly do that. And yeah, I agree with you. It's a key component not only on from the sage grouse survival, but also in general of the ecosystem. So. Um, Really good questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really want to thank Stefano, Nate, Mills, and Laura for the amazing and very informative presentation. Um, if you enjoyed this evening's presentation, or if you didn't, um, <laughs> there's a little evaluation form. You mind taking a few seconds to fill that out? Um, we get um, funding from Environment Canada, and they like to see the results of these. <laughs> there's pens up here too. Please help yourself to cookies. <laughs> Um, and again, um, this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube um, probably early next week, and I'll be able to share the link um, probably with Grasses National Park and on our Facebook page and, and the Grasses National Park Facebook page as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thanks. Thank you.